So um, if you remember, you may not remember, it's been so long, we're going to start with setting our motivation using refuge in bodhicitta, and then we're going to shift to using the foundation of all good qualities, which is a lamrim prayer, which just plants all of the main points of the path back into our minds. So those prayers were emailed to you. Um, if you don't have them, you can share with a friend, or you can just think and connect with your own motivation in your own words to yourself. Huh? Uh-huh. <clears throat> All right, so just taking a moment. <sighs> Refuge in Bodhicitta. Sanghe churan sogi churam nae janju padu dani kapsu chi dagi chen yen ki pe sonam ki adrona penje sanghe drupa sho sanghe churan sogi churam ha janju padu dani kapsu chi dagi chen yen ki pe sonam ki Roll up and cheer, sung a droop, a show, sung a chur on so he chun amma, John chu padu dani capsuchi, dagi chun yen ki pe son amki, roll up and cheer, sung a droop, a show. And then the foundation of all good qualities starts on page sixteen. The foundation of all good qualities is the kind and perfect pure Guru. Correctly following the Guru is the root of the path. By my clearly seeing this and applying great effort, please bless me to rely upon the Guru with great respect. When I have discovered that the precious freedom of this rebirth is found only once, is extremely difficult to find again and is greatly meaningful. Please bless me to unceasingly generate the mind, taking its essence day and night. This body and life are impermanent, changing like a water bubble. Remember how quickly they perish and death comes. After death, just like a shadow follows the body, the results of negative and positive karma follow. When I have found definite conviction in this, please bless me always to be conscientious, in abandoning even the slightest collection of shortcomings and in accomplishing all virtuous deeds. When I have recognized the shortcomings of samsaric perfections, there is no satisfaction in enjoying them. They are the door to all suffering, and they cannot be trusted. Please bless me to generate a strong wish for the bliss of liberation. Through my being led by this pure thought, with great remembrance, alertness, and conscientiousness, Please bless me to make keeping the individual liberation vows, the root of the teachings, my essential practice. Just as I have fallen into the sea of samsara, so have all mother transmigratory beings. By my seeing this, please bless me to train in supreme bodhicitta, which bears the responsibility of freeing transmigratory beings. Even if I develop only bodhicitta without familiarizing myself with the three types of morality, I cannot achieve enlightenment. By my seeing this well, please bless me to keep the vow of the sons of the victorious ones with fervent effort. By my having pacified distractions to wrong objects and correctly analyzed the meaning of reality, please bless me to quickly generate within my mind stream the unified path of calm abiding and special insight. When I have become a suitable vessel by training in the common path, please bless me to immediately enter the holy gateway of the fortunate beings, the supreme of all vehicles, the Vajrayana. At that time, the basis of accomplishing the two attainments is keeping my vows and samayas purely. When I have gained effortless conviction in this, please bless me to protect them even at the cost of my life. Then, when I have realized exactly the vital points of the two stages, the essence of the tantric sets, and am enjoying the yoga of four sessions with effort, without being distracted by non-meditation objects, please bless me to accomplish these according to the teachings of the holy beings. Thus, may the virtuous friends who reveal the noble path and the spiritual practitioners who correctly accomplish it have long lives. Please bless me to pacify completely 
the collections of outer and inner obstacles. In all my lives, never separated from perfect gurus, may I enjoy the magnificent dharma. And by completing the qualities of the grounds and paths, may I quickly attain the state of Vajadhara. And so just letting your mind mix and reconnect with the stages of the path, particularly altruistic intention to become enlightened, bodhicitta. And may all of the positive inner work we do here have a positive ripple effect around us. Inner peace as a catalyst for outer peace. So uh, that particular collection of prayers, um, you also have the Hebrew translation. So if you're not familiar with them and you want to have a look, you have the Hebrew whenever you need it. Um, for this class, um, this is Exploring Buddhism, which I think Tal might have mentioned what it is. This kind of bridge between the introductory teachings and the very advanced teachings. And it's a new curriculum in our organization. And what we're trying to do is meet people who have some context already with Buddhism, some context already with meditation, have been studying for some time, have been practicing for some time. So if you're brand new, it's okay, <laughs> okay, don't worry. But uh, also if you've been practicing a really long time, now is a really good opportunity to ask the more specific, deep and detailed questions that haven't felt appropriate in more of a public talk setting. So please really um, listen with a mind of where have been my obstacles with this topic, where have been my challenges with these practices, and try and have a really open and transparent attitude towards learning because the best classes are collaborative. Um, can you guys in the back hear me okay? Yep, okay. Give me some sort of urgent sort of gesture if I start getting too quiet, okay. Um, so when we're talking about meditation, that's the course we're doing now, this meditation course, we're gonna get a little bit more specific and organized about various things. Did you wanna say something? I want to ask, what's the structure of the whole program? Um, another time. Okay. You can look online, yeah. So exploring Buddhism is something that each module can be taken um, in isolation from the others. They can stand alone or they can relate to one another as a whole course that you go through. Um, I think that it's useful to approach it in terms of whatever is being offered at your local Dharma center that has some sort of facilitated guidance is probably useful. When I used to live at a Dharma center, we just went to everything. Right? We went to the beginner classes, the intermediate classes, the advanced classes. So you don't really want to get into the mindset that thinks, now I am an intermediate practitioner studying, exploring Buddhism. Yeah, and like get a lot of ego involved with it. Beginner's mind, beginner's mind, beginner's mind, okay? And, you know, I'm a beginner here with all of you, even, this, even though this is my whole life and I've been doing it my whole adult life, I'm still a beginner. I'll be a beginner for many lifetimes to come. So, um, uh, different cultures have different levels of uh, unfortunate relationship with pride. Israelis have a particularly unfortunate relationship <laughs> with pride. <laughs> Dearly, because I love you, <laughs> which isn't like it's not the worst thing, right? Anger is much worse, but we have pride. That too. You have plenty of that too, usually because your pride has been annoyed, right? <laughs> Would you have as much anger if you didn't have as much pride? So, if you can really get into that mindset of no one knows what they're doing, you don't have to know what you're doing, don't pretend to know what you're doing, then we can really collaborate and figure out how to develop our mind into healthier states how to develop the full potential of the human experience, and maybe even become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. So the fundamental premise is that your mind can be healthier 
your mind can be stronger, your moods can be more stable, you can have better relationships with the outer world, like your relationships, like your workplace, like everything to do with all of the wars and strife and conflict and pandemics and natural disasters. We can have a better relationship with those hardships. And because of that better relationship with those hardships, we're more creative in bringing positive solutions. And if there is no solution, we're still relaxed. So it's a mistake to think that having a peaceful, relaxed, and focused mind then means you don't care about the world. You actually care so much about the world, you don't want to let things like pride and anger take over your mind. You care so much, you're stopping your anger. You care so much, you're stopping your depression, your anxiety. You care so much that you're not going to indulge in these kind of states of mind that keep you stuck or keep you feeling kind of superior and entitled because you're good about recycling or something. Yeah? You're really wanting to look at the spiritual path in terms of this very big picture, this very long view. I want to develop my mind to its utmost extent. And today I want to be kind to my neighbors. So it's this kind of parallel focus where you have the big picture and the long view but you see who is in front of you, and you're meeting them as your practice. But you're not getting trapped by the little individual details of each day. You're using the individual details of each day, but not getting trapped by them, or making a story about them, or getting lost in the drama of them. So it's this question of how do you maintain detachment that is not disengaged? How do you take full responsibility without becoming enmeshed and codependent? These are the questions we want to ask ourselves. And the first one is to look internally and look at our own relationship with the mind. So when you start to meditate, and you're lucky enough to have had some sort of instruction, like focus your mind here, like on the breath, or on the mind, or on a meditative image, if you've had instruction to focus the mind, then what happens? Right? You take a minute, you kind of settle down, you get a little bit peaceful, then you get either bored or anxious. Yeah, kind of bored, sleepy, yeah, or kind of anxious, speedy, or you start planning or anticipating, or you get like performance anxiety, like do I look like a good meditator? You know, or you get this kind of feeling of, am I the only one that doesn't know what I'm doing? Yeah, this can be the case. And then you might start to relax a little bit and just say, okay, let's try. Let's try just focusing on the breath and see what happens. And you focus on the breath for a few breaths and then you forgot what the point was. And then you think about a fun TV show or a music that you like or dinner. Yeah. So it's so important that you don't put too much pressure on your meditation before you've really invested a sense of connection with the process. You want to want to. You want to have anticipated and aspired and been inspired for some time and have a lot of the details and the tools fairly clear. Then when you sit down, you know what you're doing and you kind of know what to expect. So you don't have this kind of push and pull of, Sometimes the meditation just comes together and you have these magical, mystical experiences of alignment and balance. And then another day you just fall asleep. And then another day you have a panic attack. And you just kind of feel like you're a victim of your own mind. If you study first and you study foremost, then meditation is actually not the biggest part of your practice. And it doesn't need to be. And it actually shouldn't. It's like you're training for a marathon. You do a lot of stretching, a lot of weight training, a lot of working on your nutrition and health, and also sometimes running. And then gradually more and more and more. But if you were to say, I'm gonna start training for a marathon today, and the way that I will train is to run the marathon today, would be stupid. You'd hurt yourself, yeah? So you need to learn a lot about the mechanisms of meditation 
and the different obstacles to your meditation, and you've already tried enough, and you have an experience of your own mind enough to be able to relate the teachings to your experience already. But when you're at home doing your practice, please take the pressure off of it. Just keep it very open and experiential. And just keep remembering that whatever meditation you're doing, the same kind of process is being emphasized, which is not too tight, not too loose. Focused enough to be in the zone, not so focused that you get stress and tightness. Relaxed enough that the mind is happy and spacious, but not so relaxed that you drift into sleep or boredom. That zone. And you already know the zone when you're doing work that you love. Yeah, if you're doing art, you're doing music, even a computer job that's a fun one. When you're in the zone, you have that kind of focus that is aware of the potential distractions, but not captivated or tempted by them. You know, you might hear a dog bark, you might hear a pleasant song, but you're just kind of like half aware and you're immediately back into your concentrated space. You might not actually even notice those sensory distractions. Someone else in your house comes in and says, don't you hear the car alarm outside? And now that you think about it, you do. But before you thought about it, you didn't even hear it. But you weren't meditating. You were doing some work that you like. You were in the zone. So you take that knowledge of what the zone is like, that flow state, and you bring it to meditation. And then in meditation, you deepen it and deepen it. And in meditation, if you have an ethical basis and you have an altruistic intention, that can hold you through the moments where it's not as stimulating for your mind of attachment that wants to be entertained. Because you know what it leads to does it make sense? So an ethical mind is more steady. It's not like ethics makes you a good person or something. We're all a mixed bag. We do good things, we do bad things. Talk about ethics in terms of strategy. When you're not ethical, there's a lot of movement in the mind to shield yourself from yourself or to excuse yourself or explain yourself or to justify yourself. There's a lot of agitation, yeah? And when there's that agitation, much harder to focus. So look at ethics, yes, of course, as a good way to be a good citizen and a kind person, but strategically, if you want to develop better concentration, ethics will help. So if when you're sitting, all sorts of grief comes up about the mistakes that you've made, maybe look at the mistakes you've made in your grief as your project for a while rather than forcing a focus that you're not ready for. Sometimes it helps to do a preliminary practice before you meditate, which is just to sit with no plan. Say, I'm not even meditating, I'm just sitting. No pressure at all, no focus at all, just drift. Loose associate, right? See what comes up. And just maybe 10% of focus on the breath, just to keep you from falling asleep. And then what happens is you remember the things you've forgotten. Sometimes they're good memories, sometimes they're bad ones. But you remember the things you've forgotten as soon as you sit still. So let yourself do that for a while. Write it down if you need to. And then maybe get up, have a glass of water, come back to your meditation, and then actually meditate. So just kind of working out what is the best way to make friends with your own mind is really important. Okay, so you're, you're sitting down, you're ready to meditate, you've got your space all organized, you remember the preliminary teachings about have a clean-ish room, have some nice kind of offerings, set up representations of your path, right? The six preparatory practices, the seven limb prayer, the classics of the preliminaries that we try to learn, and then usually forget yeah, you learn them when you were a baby Buddhist, and then gone. Sometimes you remember, oh, maybe I should light a candle. Yeah, I'll light a candle, that's nice. Yeah, or I'll pick some flowers. And it's something, yeah, it's something, it's lovely. And then you sit down, and your house is full of dust. Yeah, or your cushions are all over the place. Or whatever is happening that's chaotic in your environment, and you wonder why you can't focus. 
have you ever tried to do a task you didn't want to do and then clean the house instead? But then after you clean the house, you're like, I think I can do it now. Sometimes it's a distraction to clean the house. It's a form of procrastinating. But sometimes it's your wisdom that says, actually, I don't have the right foundation to do new work. I need to clean up energetically and physically from what came before. So it doesn't have to be a huge spring clean. You could just do the dishes. Yeah? You could just clean the sink. You could just dust the altar. Something symbolic. But make it sort of conducive. Give yourself a chance. So there's, there's a lot of pieces about the preliminaries that we jump over once we've heard them a few times. Yeah, and you know, maybe we spent some time in the first couple years of our Buddhist training getting the various accoutrements, right? <laughs> we got ourselves a nice little statue, nice little stupa, nice little text, arranged a little altar space, got just the right cushion. It was a whole thing, right? And it kind of helped elevate our practice and it made us happy. And then it just sat in a corner and got dusty. Yeah. It happens. It happens. The novelty wore off. So if you're lucky enough to still have a connection with your spiritual path after the novelty wears off, that's a very good sign. Yeah. If you're feeling not so inspired, not so lifted as you were the first time, but you're still here, that's a big deal. Because it means you have spiritual maturity and you're not just chasing the entertainment of the spiritual path. The smells and bells and colors and exoticness. You're actually maturing and thinking, let's get down to business. So then you can come back to your poor, dusty meditation space. Yeah, and just kind of like fluff that cushion a little bit. Plunk yourself down and say, maybe I have all of these tantric empowerments now and I can do all sorts of fancy sadhanas now. But how about I just watch the breath? Yeah, and just come back to the beginning. So this is something that you'll see again and again in Buddhism, is an invitation to be a beginner, grow, develop, and then come back and be a beginner. Learn a simple thing, elaborate, learn details, learn more and more procedures, more and more supports, and then come back to the simple form. And every time you come back to the simple form, you go more deeply and it has more significance and weight. So don't feel like it's a loss if, you've, if the shine has worn off a little bit. Actually, it's a sign we're growing up. Yeah. And the shine will come back. It'll come back in different unexpected ways, in more stable ways. And it will start to feel like things in your meditation are happening from you, not to you. In the early stages, we might have just had karmic imprints and associations from other places and really cool, interesting things happened as soon as we started to just sit still. And then, not so much later. And then we think there's something wrong. Just have to go back and now figure out what are the mechanisms for that and how do I make my motivation more expansive and more deep. So, um, we're going to talk about the things you focus on in meditation. So when you're doing your meditation practice at this stage, you want to be a little bit organized and decide on what is going to be the emphasis. And it becomes much more up to you, right? You could go to a fancy Tibetan Lama and say, what should my practice be? And they'll say, read the Lam Rim. Yeah? Figure it out. <laughs> right? <laughs> like. Where are you? How are you? What strikes you? Basically, do what I've been telling you. And then that's overwhelming, because if you've been studying something like the stages of the path, the Lam Rim, your options are quite numerous. Yes? <laughs> and you look at your options and you go, right, practice the Lam Rim. And you're, you know, you get that paralyzed feeling of being overwhelmed. And you get the paralyzed feeling of, I know now what I'm supposed to do. Six preparatory practices, seven limb prayer, dust, dust, offering, offering, these prayers, this, 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 this. And you get so overwhelmed by what you know you're supposed to do that you don't do anything. Yeah, and you think, oh, maybe I'll do some mantras while I walk the dog, which is great. But, you know, it's almost like you know too much, right? 
you know too much and you freak yourself out because how can you possibly be perfect with all of the things you know, bringing them all to the cushion in one session, you sort of blow a fuse. Yeah. The options are so endless that you become paralyzed and can't pick. So in this space, you have to keep remembering that there is always a difference between what you understand intellectually and what you can do experientially. That gap is normal. What you know, what you understand, and what you can actually do. There's a huge gap between the two. And gradually, you integrate. And that's not a problem, it's not a deficit, it's a natural part of the path. So then you look at the Lam Rim with a bit more spaciousness, and you can kind of think in terms of, well, I could just start at the beginning with the topics in the beginning. That's a good approach. Meditate on perfect human rebirth for a while. It's a good antidote to depression. It's a good antidote to self-loathing. It's a good way of feeling inspired and motivated. Yep, I could just start at the beginning. Or you might say, I will start at the beginning, but right now I need a pre-beginning, which is to do what excites me but not in an attached way. So what do you, how do you plan that out? You sit and think, right, what's going on in my life? Okay, I have some anger or angst around this issue, and almost every single day, there is a tightness in my heart because of this relationship dynamic, or this obstacle in my resources, or something internal that is private and poignant, but every day I hit my head up against this issue. And then instead of saying, how do I ask advice about how to fix this issue externally, I'm sure you know how to do that. You go internally and say, what is the affliction that is making my heart shut down? Because you can have all of the obstacles in the world, but still have your heart open. And you do have many obstacles in your life where still your heart is open even though there's a hard situation. So why this? This one thing in your life right now? Why is this a catalyst or a condition for you to shut down? And you start kind of tidying up your boundaries of what is it exactly? Is it kind of an ignorance-related affliction? Is it an attachment-related affliction? Or is it an anger-related affliction? Because it will be a variation on one of those three. Yeah. And so then feel instead of feeling like this is the big problem in my life that I avoid thinking about or I'm ashamed of not being able to cope with, you think this is the very fuel of my practice today. Thank goodness I've identified it. Yeah, and you think, okay, it boils down to many, many, many details, many, many, many issues, lots of history over time, but really it's just attachment. All right, that's embarrassing. I'll focus on attachment. Yeah, and then the issue often sorts itself out. Either logistically and specifically things change in the relationship or the dynamic, or your relationship to it changes so much, it doesn't matter if it gets better because you're fine. It hasn't shut down your heart. So we have to keep remembering that we come to these classes and these courses often with an idea that I will find more strategies to solve the problems in my life, but then we turn it externally like, how can I figure out how to communicate better with my mother-in-law? Rather than going internally and asking, why do I shut down my heart when she speaks to me that way? Why is my heart shutting down? Yeah. And then you're working on that. She either changes or she doesn't, but you have not given the power over to the outside world to steal your peace. Yeah. Do you know what I mean, right? In terms of just being very practical about your practice, you can either just kind of think, yep, I've got everything, all the afflictions take turns, it's a big balagant, right? So I'll just start at the beginning or pick your most dominant affliction and give that the power. Yeah, in terms of your practice and what you focus and study on and what you change your mind in response towards. 
So that's what this section is about, right? Is these observed objects. These are your objects of meditation. These are the things you choose when you're deciding what to meditate on. They all boil down to, to quote, objects of this type. And when we say objects, we mean mentally generated objects, not like outside things. But if you want to have a look at that section, it's a really useful section. So um, in the hard copy, it's page 153. And in the ebook, it's paid, it's location 2991. So, observed objects. It says, because sentient beings have different tendencies and dispositions, the Buddha described several objects that could be the observed object for cultivating serenity. And when it says serenity, it's talking about calm abiding, shine, right? This shamatha practice. So in general, any object, internal or external, can be used, even a pebble or a candle. However, this physical thing itself is not the object used. It's a conceptual appearance of it. Okay, so if we turn over just to the list, we look at, we're looking mainly at extensive objects today, and that's the list that's on the board. These are the extensive objects. So we have analytical images, which are observed by an insight that analyze its object. So, so this first case is a case in which you would say, I'm having a lot of issues with attachment, so I'm going to do analytical meditation on attachment. I'm going to really unpack the false logic that I bring to attachment. I'm going to study a lot about where attachment comes from, what feeds it, and more importantly, how to diffuse it and take care of it in my mind. How to manage it differently. To give myself some more options and creativity in my daily life. Right? So a non-analytical image is what you would expect are observed by serenity that focuses on the object without analyzing it. So analytical and non-analytical images are posited in terms of how the mind observes the object. They are conceptual appearances of the object, which may be the five objects for purifying behavior, expertise, and afflictions, etc. So this is something that you can look into a little bit more after class, and your um, homework is to read chapter six before we meet again. So if you read chapter six, it will help clarify some of these things. But what we're talking about really is asking ourselves, do we have enough understanding of a concept to stay with it single-pointedly or not, right? So something good like compassion if you talk about it, if you think about it, if you have studied it a lot, it just takes a few moments of thought to really become merged with the concept of compassion, at which point you just stay there. But if it's something less familiar, like how to overcome attachment, you do the analytical form. Does it make sense? So the analytical form is like a preliminary or like the introductory version of the meditation, but don't think of it as lower because you can't just drop into a single pointed meditation on a conceptual concept without having thought about it first. A whole lot. Yeah. So then practically speaking, what we do in the meditation is we do some analysis and then during the analysis, there's part of you that finally gets it. Yeah, you get it. Yep, attachment is problematic. I knew that before I started, but right now I'm feeling it. I'm in it, the awareness of that. And once you're in that place, you just stay there without analysis, even if it's only like 20 seconds or 30 seconds. And then when your mind gets distracted, you bring back in analysis about it. So, um, shall we try? Yes. So get yourself into a good posture for meditating. And in this meditation, we'll go back and forth between analysis and stability. 
but all with a concept. Because I think we all know how to do stabilizing meditation on the breath or the mind or an image. Now we're going to try something less common, which is a concept. So start as always with just be with your posture. Let go of any tension in the posture. And revive your motivation to yourself, thinking I do this practice in order to develop my mind so that I can be of greatest benefit to all living beings. Waking up the bodhicitta that you understood, inviting altruism back to the cushion. And in order to let surface distractions settle, spend a couple of minutes focused on the breath. Just the breath, no agenda, stabilize there. Your only plan is to watch the breath. And whatever distractions arise, whether sensory distractions or internal thoughts, have a kind relationship to them, notice them, and then consciously come back to the breath.
on purpose. So not suppressing them, not chasing them. Just gently disengage when distractions capture your attention. And then consciously shift your focus to analysis. And your object of analysis is what is attachment and how is it harmful. So first we have to identify what is attachment. And so we think of what we know already, that attachment exaggerates the good qualities of a person, of a situation, of an object. It sees the good and then makes it too big. Thinks that the good exists from the side of the object. With people, it forgets that the person has good as well as bad days, neutral days, a whole spectrum of behavior. But attachment zeroes in on just a couple of traits that it likes and says this is who they are. This is who they should always be. And then gets angry or disappointed when people are not consistent in the way you want them to be. Attachment thinks that objects or situations or people are the cause, the reason for our happiness. That somehow they give us happiness from their own side. Attachment forgets that it's your relationship to those objects, the ideas you bring to those interactions, the karma ripening during those interactions, and countless other things that bring the happiness. (coughs) So just take a minute and identify what is attachment like experientially for you? What do you say to yourself? (coughs) What beliefs do you carry? Explain your own attachment to yourself analytically. Have an active conversation with yourself about your own attachment. 
identifying it. The way attachment looks like love, until it doesn't get what it wants, then it turns into anger. It might want happiness for another person, but like a business deal that expects something back, feels entitled to something back. Try to pinpoint the way attachment exaggerates, projects, expects. And as you observe and identify it, bring in an observation of how it harms you, how it harms people in your life, the pressure it puts. The way it makes plans that are doomed to fail the way it opens the door to disappointment, even rage. The way it sets yourself up to be let down. All because you exaggerated what was possible. Because you narrowed your focus to see only the good, not the whole picture. And see if you can take all of this analysis and settle single-pointedly on a conclusion that attachment is negative, it's poisonous, it's harmful. And as you land single-pointedly, don't identify with your attachment or think that you're bad for having it. See it as an entity that can arise in the mind. Something that prevents health, that stops clarity, that ruins love. So when you touch that truth, stay with it single-pointedly. 
attachment is harmful. Land there. And then dedicate thinking, may I identify attachment when it arises? And in the identifying it, may I remember its harmful component and address it swiftly, dispel it swiftly so that I don't harm myself or others. And may all of this energy go towards me awakening and developing my fullest potential in order to be of greatest benefit to all living beings. So we'll have a break um, until 11.50 and uh, see you soon. And if you don't have the book yet, I'm realizing that maybe some of you haven't been, um, uh, haven't gotten organized with the book yet. We won't go too much into it today then, um, but please do read chapter six before we meet again and make sure you have it in time for the next class. So it's following in the Buddhist footsteps. It's by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Venerable Tubton Chudron. It's there on the board and uh, see you in a bit. <laughs>